Father, thank you for, for this day. Thank you for the privilege it is to be here. We pray that we would be attentive and uh, make informed decisions as we move forward and be respectful of those around us. Thank you for this time that you have de delegated for our health committee. Uh, this is an area for our citizens that is a challenge every day. May we take our responsibilities uh, sincerely and respectfully and, and do so in a way to, to help our people. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Shelly, roll call, please. Yes, sir. Mike Dobbins. Here. Dora Petskowski. Here. Keith Austin. Here. Danny Callison. Here. Julia Coates. Here. Sean Crittenden. Here. Joe Deere. Aye. Rex Jordan. Here. Johnny Kidwell. Here. Daryl Legg. Wes Nofire. Aye. Joshua Sam. Here. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Movina Shot Pouch. Aye. E.O. Smith. Here. Kendessa Teehee. Aye. Victoria Vesquez. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Shelley. <clears throat> Before we get into the agenda, I would like for speaker to address our protocols today as we move forward in our committee meetings. Well, because of the uh, recent spike in the COVID, uh, different Omicron and, and COVID, we're going to have everything will be uh, streamed. There will be nobody in here today to give the reports. Um, we would like to keep that at a minimum. I realize there may be some times where some people may have to come down for <coughs> for whatever reason to address something, but, um, and as well as we could, we need to, to stay remote uh, until the numbers start going down. It's just, it's really kind of distressing uh, to see we're back where we were. So we need to do what we need to do as councilmen and, and part of this body to keep each other safe and to keep others safe that come in here, so. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, we need to, I hope you've had a chance to look at our minutes. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. In a second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries to approve the minutes. Moving down to reports. First up is the Claremore Service Unit with Mr. George Valier. I understand George may not be with us today. So, uh, if you have, after, particularly after looking at George's report, if you have questions, I would suggest you get those to George directly. He'll be happy to address them. I assume all of you know how to reach George. So, uh, but George uh, will not be giving a report today. Uh, next listed is uh, Cherokee Nation Health Services, Dr. Steve Jones. He is out of commission today. And Mr. Wayne Caldwell will be giving the report. He arrived here and then discovered our remote policy for today. He's en route back to his office so he can report remotely. So he is in process of doing that. And uh, along with Dr. Montgomery, he's going to be available today as well. So it's going to be 15, 20 minutes before they get back to report remotely. So we're going to do things a little bit out of order today and, and uh, listen to the reports from Cherokee Nation Public Health. And I hope Miss Lisa Pivick and Dr. Yan are available. Hello. Hello, good, good afternoon. I'm available. Um, Lisa Pivick, Cherokee Nation Public Health. Um, good afternoon, I wish we were coming to you under better circumstances. We, uh, from Public Health, you have my report. If you have any questions on the report, I'll be happy to address those. Um, currently, all public staff have switched to response to the COVID surge and our process of um, doing case investigation, contact tracing calls to patients and employees, and helping work to respond to COVID as best we can, um, and to maintain other activities that we can as we move forward. Dr. Gann is here, and I think the time would probably be best spent listening to him give you an update. And as I said before, I'm here for any type of questions you might have. But, uh, just please keep our staff in your thoughts as well. Everybody, all of healthcare and all of public health, everyone is, is pretty stressed at this time. Thanks. Dr. Dick, Dr. Gann, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. If you could go, just go right ahead with, with your report. 
Sure, thank you. So um, last week uh, was a record-breaking week with COVID-19. We tested six, uh, 7,644 people. Our previous record was right at 6,000, and we had 1,934 new cases. Uh, previously, it was about a year ago, we had 1,412, so more than 500 more than we've ever had before in a week. Um, <clears throat> The previous week, we had just over 600 cases. So we went from 600 cases to uh, almost 2,000 cases. And the week before that, we're in the 200. So extremely rapid rise in the number of cases. And I suspect uh, this week we'll have uh, even more. We'll see how it goes. Our positive test rate last week was 25%. Oklahoma numbers are on the same uh, trajectory. Uh, they have breaking records and the hospitals in Oklahoma are at capacity. The number of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 continues to increase. Um, and, you know, there are other people in the hospital as well. So for, for a while now, the hospitals have been at capacity, but now COVID-19 is, is really going up. For hospital admissions, we're not near the record yet. Uh, in Oklahoma, it's just over 1,000, and the highest we had, the last peak, was around 1,500. Um, it's interesting, uh, in Oklahoma right now, according to CDC, 54% of people in Oklahoma are vaccinated, so it's not a, a high number. And of those fully vaccinated, only 32% have received the booster. So there's still a, a huge portion of our population that's susceptible to the virus. Still, uh, vaccination and getting boosted is your best protection to staying out of the hospital. Uh, one of our epidemiologists um, studied every patient who was admitted to Hastings for COVID-19 in 2021. And out of 274 people hospitalized, only four of those had been vaccinated. So 270 of the 274 people admitted to Hastings had not received a COVID vaccine. The same seems to be uh, true with the Omicron variant. It's rising quite rapidly, of course, um, and we don't have a great feel for that. But the data coming out of the United States, primarily from Case Western University, is that the death rate and hospitalization rates are lower than with Delta and the previous variants, but the sheer numbers are still filling up our hospitals. So we have twice as many cases and the hospitalization rates are half. It's the same number of people hospitalized. And you've seen the reports that if you look at uh, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare staff across the country, about 20% have left the profession over the last year. So there's always staffing issues. Um, CDC guidelines have changed dramatically, and we're communicating those as best as we can. Uh, they're a little complex. There's a different set of guidelines for K-12 schools and for healthcare providers and for the general public. So we're helping uh, people with all of that. Uh, contact tracing is ongoing. Um, we're definitely at capacity in um, prioritizing Cherokee Nation employees um, to keep our services up and running as best as we can. And we're bringing in more staff to do more contact tracing. So I might address that more. Um, I'd be glad to take any questions. Questions for Dr. Ian, Junior. Uh, are all, all the ventilators in use? On the no, and I, I'm not sure the, the the house supervisors report from this morning. I don't know if we had anyone on the ventilator. Um, Lisa, do you remember? Do you see that? So no, we have. Yep. No, but Dr. Montgomery's logging on, and he can address those questions about the hospital. I think. Yeah. <coughs> Dr. Gann, this is Wayne. As of this morning, we did have one patient on the ventilator. But I think our ICUs are full. Our ICU beds are full. Okay, Mike. Yes, sir. Are you um, seeing a difference in between 
I assume that most of these are what the Omicron probably, or do you do you test? Are you having those different tests, or do we know if it's one or the other? The, we get those data from the state health department, um, and their latest data showed in the state that 57% of the cases were Omicron. That's that is kind of old. If you look at the shape of our curve and the rate of increase. I'm very confident that we're well over 80% of the cases are the Omicron variant. And are you seeing the effects different? I know when this first happened, we didn't have medicine. We didn't have a lot of things that we have now. And vac you know, we didn't have the vaccinations. So are you seeing that that has, is making a difference on maybe how bad people are getting sick, whether they're vaccinated or not, whether they have boosters or not? Are you seeing that? I don't have a great feel for that. We are tracking what percent of the people who test positive are vaccinated and what percent are boosted. And before the surge last week, about 27% of the, of the people who tested positive had been vaccinated and 1% had been boosted. And we'll update those numbers this week. I don't have a good feel for the severity of the illness. So I think most of the calls I get are from people who are very sick. I can tell you that, um, you know, when, when you hear that the, the disease is less severe, it's kind of a relative term, right? So if you have moderate, moderate symptoms, that means you're at home with muscle aches and pains and a fever and a cough, which isn't, you know, might not be moderate to a lot of people who are at home with those symptoms. Um, the data is showing a lower rate of hospitalizations and that being vaccinated and being boosted decreases the severity of the symptoms and prevents most hospitalizations. All right, thank you, sir. And Doc, uh, Julia has her hand up yes, too. Sir. Go ahead, Julia. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gann, I wanna um, Make sure I heard you right. I think you said that 20% of medical staff, hospital staff across the country, is that correct, have left their position since the outset of the pandemic? Yes, ma'am. That's a, okay. the, the report. 20% have left health care. Right. Um, it, it, are those um, numbers approximately the same at Cherokee Nation? Are we doing better, worse? What's I'm not really sure if Mr. Caldwell might be able to address that. Or I don't have those exact statistics for you right now, but I would say that, you know, with other measures, we typically fall in line with the uh, data that we see across the United States. So I would assume that we, we do fall in that line. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Sean? Um, Dr. Gann or, or Corey, I see Corey up there, had a school ask me if we're going to be dispersing tests where they can test their students at school or are we going to um, just have them go to our facilities like they've always done for testing? I'm, I'm not aware of, of any plans. Um, that might be a good question for the staff or for Dr. Jones. I appreciate the uh, the question, Councilor Critton. And at this time, we have no plans to send tests directly to schools. I would recommend they continue using our own healthcare facilities. All right, that makes makes sense. Thank you, guys. Also, Dr. Gann, uh, since this uh, new onset, you hear people testing positive, and you hear of uh, you know, well, well, I'm okay as long as I wear a mask since I'm vaccinated. What's the absolute latest? You test positive, how long are you supposed to be home? Those around you, um, when do they need to quarantine? What's the absolute latest? Because I'm already hearing a whole bunch of different stories uh, on that. So if you don't care, Dr. Gann, tell us, tell us what you'd tell somebody that called you testing positive and uh, what they should go go do after that yes sir so um, for the general public when someone tests positive for COVID-19 they're isolated uh, for 10 days all right now you can shorten that 10-day isolation period 
if on day five you test negative and you have 24 hours without a fever and other symptoms improving. Now those five days start on the onset of symptoms. So the onset of symptoms is day zero and you start counting from there. So in, if you test negative on day five, then you can be released from isolation early, but you should wear a mask around other people for an additional five days. So there are people who can't wear a mask. For example, a 18 month old in one of our Head Start classes, that person might test positive and then test negative on day, on day five and symptoms improving in 24 hours without a fever, but they can't wear a mask. So they should stay isolated for a full 10 days. Okay. Uh, stay isolated yeah. for a full 10 days, you can be released without a negative test, right? Just 24 hours without a fever and other symptoms improve. There are a few caveats attached to that. If you have pneumonia, you are hospitalized and you're isolated for 20 days, or if you're moderately or severely immunocompromised. Hmm. So, yeah, Man, that's, so they, that's kind of like algebra, isn't it? Trying to figure all that out. Uh, but isolate 10 days if you're positive, that's kind of where they'd start, right? Right. And right. then if you test negative on day five and 24 hours without a fever and other symptoms improving, then you can be released from isolation on day six, but you need to wear a mask around other people. Thank you, sir. Hey, Dr. Gann, um, I know we've been pushing the uh, vaccination for about a year now, and uh, the state's over at around 50% vaccinated, um, seeing as you can't get someone vaccinated as Omicron wave has increased, uh, are we putting anything out there that can share with the public of what they can do to help boost their immune system so that way if they did come in contact with it, uh, that they're less, maybe less likely to catch it just because they can't get vaccinated because it takes, you know, that 28 days, I think, to become fully vaccinated. So that way, if they're concerned, if they're worried about getting sick, just much like they would if the flu season comes around, what they can take to increase their own personal immunity uh, response. We don't have any guidelines that I'm aware of from CDC on recommendations for nutritional supplements or exercise or other uh, over-the-counter prescription medications to boost their immune system. I haven't sent out any or, you know, recommended any to communications. Have you seen anything, Lisa? No, I just think the general guidance is still the same. Mask, uh, away from crowds, um, do the general same mitigation measures layer that we've been doing um, throughout the pandemic. I don't know of any particular um, guidance from anybody on boosting immune system. That would be a question for Dr. Montgomery, possibly, or Dr. Dan. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I was just something that it was curious to me because uh, there's got to be some way that we maybe can encourage people just to be healthier throughout this time, just like we would do during a flu season in the winter months of what we can do to stay active, what we can eat, what we can take that, uh, that boosts our own uh, immune system. Uh, but other than that, appreciate you guys. Uh, we're keeping you guys in our thoughts, and um, I'll be waiting to ask more questions at the, whenever uh, uh, health services give their full report. So appreciate it, Dr. Gann. Appreciate it, Ms. Pivik. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, been doing a little research, too, since this uh, viruses came back, or the new mut mutated viruses came back. You know, from what I read, in the next couple of weeks, it's going to spike. But another thing that I've read is there is a uh, starting to be a serious mask shortage throughout the nation in different places. And I know we have our own. Have we uh, vamped our mask making up here? I mean, are we making them? Are we going to make them more readily available to the to the students in different places like that? Because you know, I've this weekend I went to Walmart and just. I think that I might have saw three people with masks on, and there were hundreds of people in Walmart, and I was one of them. Uh, been to different places in Tulsa the last several weeks. Nobody's wearing a mask. I don't know about preventive, but to me, um, the big deal was why we didn't get the flu as much as we did in talking to different ER doctors. It's because we were washing our hands, we were wearing masks, and, and you know I know we get tired of doing that, but people aren't wearing them. I'm just 
from where I've been, they're not following safety guidelines. So um, I think that in itself would probably be uh, one of the major things that we could do is to wear a mask. So that's just a, something I've noticed from the public. They're, they don't seem to be, nobody seems to be taking it like they'll catch it because they're not wearing them. So uh, thoughts? You know, that's been a consistent message since beginning the pandemic. Uh, wear a mask, wash your hands, six feet distance, uh, don't gather in crowds of people you don't know their vaccination status. And, you know, that, that uh, leads to caution fatigue, we call it mitigation fatigue, that people are tired of it and they're not going to do it. So we consistently put out that message and, um, you know, recommend that people wear a mask and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. So I, I'm not aware of anyone um, unable to access a mask, you know, but I'm not uh, in touch with everyone. So, and I don't know about our facilities, uh, our mask making facility, well, what they're doing. I'm not, I'm not plugged into that. Yeah, I think you know, one of the things uh, we can do, Mr. Speaker, is set the example. You know, when you walk to Walmart with a mask on, people recognize you. They will hear someone, someone I can trust, someone I know, and he's wearing a mask. So maybe that's a good idea, and it plants that seed. So that's, I think that's uh, very important as well. And I, I think it is our responsibility to be a little proactive because, you know, if, if we could offer masks to churches or different places like that or, you know, we have in the schools, I think that would go a long way in, in, in showing that we, you know, we are uh, uh, cautious and, and we want to be careful and we, we want to lead the way in people peop keeping people safe. I just think that would be good as, you know, as a Cherokee Nation that we, especially now, that we could make those kind of things available for places where there's going to be some congregation and, and things like that. So I know that's not your deal, just making an uh, observation. That's a good point. Liz? Uh, yeah, I had one more follow-up question. I think uh, Dr. Gann or maybe even Chief of Staff might be able to answer it. We put out, uh, the Chief put out an administrative order that um, we are doing testing two times a week, I think, with our employees and staff. <clears throat> one question is, um, have we started that yet? Who's supplying the testing? Because I know that the, uh, there is apparently an, a nationwide shortage of tests. And then um, do we forecast that shutting down our institutions, seeing as the Omicron variant seems to be less symptomatic, so a lot of people might test positive prior to showing any symptoms. Therefore, are we sending them home for five days or 10 days? And if that happens, are we gonna start seeing, like I said, our institutions start collapsing? Mr. Speaker, I'd be glad to attempt to address this question. We are moving forward with testing employees twice a week. Actually, contracted with the same company that CNB is using. As uh, you uh, mentioned, there, there's a little bit of a shortage nationwide, so we're gearing up for that. It's going to be a phased-in approach. We'll be testing uh, some non-health employees this week, and we'll be phasing in others in the coming days and, and weeks. Uh, but yes, testing twice a week, and it is our goal to not only keep our employees and our communities, our citizens safe, but it's also our goal to keep our services open uh, without having to quarantine large groups of people. So uh, testing twice a week, uh, work with Dr. Gann on this and several others in, in our healthcare system. We believe testing twice a week will, will help us to uh, maintain our operations as best as we possibly can. And we will, uh, as far as quarantining on those positive cases, we will follow the advice of uh, what our healthcare team has put out. And Dr. Gann kind of alluded to that a few minutes ago, I think, as far as uh, chart of what to do when a person is uh, either been confirmed positive or been exposed to a known positive. Okay. And who's the company that we're using, that CMB is using as well? Uh, we are using a company uh, called Inspire. Inspire. Okay. And then on <clears throat> the employees that do test positive, <clears throat> they're getting sent home, obviously. Are we, uh, I know contract tracing has been backed up <clears throat> because the number of positive tests. Are, are we also looking at sending 
the staff members that they work with home to self-isolate until we get their test results or are we go ahead and trying to test them then? How is that kind of working? I guess um, if, uh, say, an employee comes in, he tests positive and his staff members are negative but they've been in contact, are we isolating them or are they still maintaining work until they test positive? That's a, that's a great question, and I'll let Dr. Gann weigh in, but it really depends on the individual circumstances. Uh, you know, it's our goal to have all of our employees wearing their masks while they're on uh, property. If um, both uh, or all employees are wearing their mask, it really cuts down on the risk. And also being fully vaccinated, including the booster, uh, makes a, a huge difference. So that's, that's uh, what we encourage our employees to do. We're offering incentives to do so. And if we can do that, then we'll really cut down on the spread here in the workplace. Okay. So the, Mr. Nofire, the um, definition of close contact hasn't changed. So whether someone tests positive through this routine testing or otherwise, it's within six feet for more than 15 minutes without both people wearing a mask. Right. So that's how we determine who's quarantined and who's not. Right? As uh, Chief of Staff said, if they're following the protocols at work, then that shouldn't happen. Um, gotcha. And then that, you know, you said that fewer people have symptoms with Omicron, and I haven't seen that in the data, that the symptoms are milder, but I haven't seen data that more people are asymptomatic with Omicron. But I also recall that if you don't have symptoms, you're still contagious. Right. <clears throat> I was First just... I was going off a science study that they had done over the past month over the uh, uh, death mortality rate of Omicron and was just looking at that and trying to say there might be more people who test positive that aren't showing symptoms. That was my concern. And then also the concern yeah. of, of possible spread and infecting other people within the work environment that do test positive, uh, even though they might be wearing their mask. Um, just was curious to that so but I appreciate y'all answering the questions that I had appreciate you Junior. in this go around uh, would you say there was on our teenagers and stuff is the number tripled or or doubled or whatever if there's so many more younger younger kids are having it now I know down in our area I'm, I'm getting a lot of calls that the parents are calling saying their kids have it and they're, they're not knowing what to do about going to work and all that, but it just seemed like a lot of teenagers have really had it. And I just want to be having kind of numbers on that. The, the last numbers are I have or for the week um, between Christmas and New Year's. So now that the kids have gone back to school last week, then we'll be able to analyze those numbers from last week and see was the 18 to 35 year olds uh, had the highest proportion of cases between Christmas and New Year's. So we'll analyze uh, last week's data this week and, and we'll see. But I'm here and getting calls routinely from the schools and from our childhood development centers and early head start kids are testing positive. So, um, but we'll have some hard numbers for you this week. Yep. Any other questions right now for Dr. Gann or Ms. Pivek? Melvina. Is it true that uh, the infusion now is only given to severely ill because of supply? Dr. Montgomery, do you want to answer that one? We have changed the guidelines for the uh, criteria to receive the infusion. I wouldn't use the word severely ill, but we have we are wanting to optimize the benefit of the antibody treatment by giving it to the group that is most in need and most likely to stay out of the hospital if given the antibody. And it is those that are over, that are unvaccinated over the age of 65, have a, a, a weight or what's called a BMI greater than 35 and that are diabetic. We have done a retrospective look back at who was hospitalized. And this is the group of patients that have ended up in the hospital and we want to do our best to prevent that from happening. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> Just had a follow-up question for Dr. Montgomery. Um, I, I heard you say BMI, that's the uh, your body fat percentage, right? Someone who's obese. 
Body mass index. Correct. Yeah, so that's something that might help out with our public health directors if we could maybe get out that is just kind of simply losing weight. If you're less obese, you're more likely probably to have a little bit more ability to fight va the, uh, the virus if you catch it, just so that way you don't have to get on a ventilator. It might be something to help out. But I appreciate it, Dr. Montgomery and everything you're doing. Appreciate Thank you. Chair. You know, the questions for our public health people. But before we move on to uh, hear our regular monthly report from Dr. Jones, in fact, Mr. Caldwell is, is subbing for him. Lisa, could I ask you a non-COVID uh, question? Okay, yes. Uh, on the, it says January 2022, we're starting a school health program consisting yes. of 42 schools. Could you kind of briefly summarize what that is? So what is going on right now is that we have the applications for our annual diabetes um, pro program that we do projects with the school, school health projects. And those, applica those applications are going out this month for schools to apply. Okay. And um, there'll be more information. Um, each and anybody out in the schools, most of the school administrators and teachers are familiar with their local public health educators, and they can reach out to those public health educators or most certainly reach out to me as well for questions about that. But that should be coming out. I talked to them last week, and I believe that it should be within a week that those will be available. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, are you there? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah. Mr. Caldwell is is uh, pinch hitting for Dr. Jones today. He's he is he is out. So the floor is yours, Dr. Mr. Caldwell. Thank you very much. Uh, Happy New Year, Council. Glad to be here today. Uh, I'm going to hit uh, some high points uh, for you. I've been listening to the previous conversation and it is geared towards uh, your interest in hearing about the pandemic. And I wanted to give you some. Uh, health service data statistics that we have seen um, and then we can backtrack into the report if you have questions on the report but the report is in your packet um, i did want to give you a quick overview of what we're seeing at hastings currently um, as you can imagine the emergency department has seen large volume of patients coming in uh, that are ill um, we have been offering testing outside of the emergency department to take that um, task off of the emergency department and, and you know, give them a little relief. In Hastings currently, we do have, as of this morning, we have 11, 11 patients that are admitted that are positive for COVID. We have four that are receiving remdesivir in the hospital. And then we have one patient, as I, I mentioned earlier, that is on, that it was on the vent as of this morning. Um, again, large volumes to the emergency department. That leads me into my comments about testing. Uh, today, testing was a, uh, we, we were had a very long lines of testing today. Um, we're, we're putting every resource available to our testing efforts. Wanted to provide you um, the information with, so you can provide to your constituents of our, our testing operations. We are, are offering testing Monday through Friday throughout the reservation at our health centers. That will be a combination of drive through and curbside. We are offering weekend testing as well in support of the emergency department in Tahlequah. Um, those hours are varying um, based on the demand that we are seeing throughout the week. Um, we are also looking into this current holiday that is that is we are facing next Monday. Uh, we are gearing up. We have a discussion later today of what testing we can offer. Uh, to support the emergency department, any need that may be throughout the reservation. More information to come on that we will share as we as we uh, develop that. The, the next thing I wanted to move into was the uh, monoclonal antibody infusions. Um, Dr. Montgomery did uh, provide the latest of the guidance on that. I uh, just did, did want you all to know that we are offering that um, Monday through Friday uh, throughout the throughout the reservation at the dedicated sites. That we have and we're also offering that on the weekend as well in support of the emergency department again those hours on the weekend are varying based on the demand that we see um two other things i wanted to hit on and then i then i will start, turn the floor to you um to you have um we are it was mentioned about masks i just wanted to, to point out we do not have any mask shortage right now 
Uh, the brand of mask uh, could vary based on uh, you know, the availability, but uh, currently we are okay on N95 and surgical masks. We, we do not have a need for those. Um, the last point I wanted to make uh, is to give our employees praise. Every day we come in and there's, you know, we decide maybe at 805 that we're going to open up another testing lane or, or whatever we're going to do it this weekend. And people always come to the floor and make it available to the, to the citizens that we serve. So I can't, uh, I, I can't go without being said that we do owe a lot of praise to the staff. If you see someone, if you're able to, to uh, stop in at a, you know, a drive through effort from afar and just say thank you, that would be much appreciated as people are out there giving it in the, the, the cold weather as of this morning and any other time we ask them to do it. That's all I have. Sean? <clears throat> Wayne or uh, any anyone else, the the lines, as you said, were were long today at different places. Um, now, just your ordinary person that comes through and gets a test and they're positive, you know, not the ones that can't breathe and need to be uh, serious action taken. But if you test positive, is there are they given medicine, antibiotics, are they? Or is it just uh, you're positive, go home, keep that fever down, drink plenty of fluids, and uh, uh, stay home for 10 days? Or is there medicine that we can give them? Thank you. Dr. Montgomery? Counselor, again, it's, um, as I mentioned before, we were fortunate to be able to offer monoclonal antibody to a variety, a large number of patients but because of our our inventory being reduced, we're now being more judicious, you might say, with its offering it. And again, we're offering it to unvaccinated people over the age of 65 with a BMI over 35 and people with diabetes. There are going to be some people that are not going to be offered the treatment simply because we just don't have adequate supply. Antibiotics are not what are given for a viral infection. So again, we just know statistically if you're otherwise healthy and test positive, and if you've been vaccinated and boosted, the likelihood of getting more sick is very, very low. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, just the the uh, the medicine that is being reserved for the ones that really, really need it. That's that's your more serious cases, right? That's exactly and right. We know from past experience those are the people who end up in the hospital and are okay. most risk for severe illness. Yeah, and all of us here, you know, whether you work in a school or whatever business you're you're hearing about different positive cases coming up just and most most of those uh you know thank god uh haven't been serious i know serious is a relative term but uh but you know their symptoms hadn't been harsh enough to 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 do you know the medicine you were talking about or of course the vent but uh so, but are we encouraging people that first have a symptom, go get in line and get tested, even from the young to the healthy looking, we want them there testing, right? Yes, we do. We want them to know for sure whether it's due to COVID or not. And if it is, that then enhances our chances of keeping them from spreading it because they know, they have the knowledge that they're positive for COVID. Okay, thank you. Dr. Montgomery, uh, what other therapeutics do we have at our disposal besides the antibody infusion? What other therapeutics do we have? Remdesivir is given to inpatients, very specific inpatients. For outpatient, though, currently the monoclonal antibody is the treatment of choice, and that's what we're trying to utilize as judiciously as possible. There are some newer oral medications that have become available, and we'll be implementing their use in the near future. But right now we're not utilizing the oral pills at this point. We have, an adequate, we have an adequate supply of the monoclonal antibody, which is the most effective. So that's what we're offering at this time. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery. Joe. Hey, Wayne, you got a backup plan with staffing since they're catching COVID and having to leave clinic and hospitals, or is the backup plan just to shut down those services if you don't have staff? The last option we ever want to do is shut down operations uh, to our citizens. 
but we do we do meet on a regular basis to discuss those you know uh, the staffing situations that we uh, that arise. Um, we, we do have plans in place, um, but it's very it's based on the local level. You know, varying staffing metrics are used throughout the reservation at the clinics. There's different um, amounts of staff available at each clinic, so it varies. There's not solid numbers, but we do work with the local level to determine the uh, the staffing and the uh, ways of providing service to the citizens we serve. Okay, because I know the the testing is going on around the the nation and you know there's a lot of nurses and staff that are directly involved with COVID people. I mean the testing's gone up and they're at a high risk already. And that's what I was wondering what the, the backup plan was for staff that catch COVID in those areas because I know they rotate different things, you know, whether they come from dentistry, optometry or wherever they're coming from. And that will hit the appointment side when backing up appointments. Because um, I got a call from a constituent that got notified his appointment that he was supposed to have surgery on got moved back 90 days because of staff shortage. That's why I was wanting to know because it seems to be funneling down to services. Yeah, there's not one direct answer I can give you, Counselor Deer, uh, but we do continually meet to evaluate the staffing um, strategies that we have in place. We've been blessed with very good staff that are flexible and go support us in other areas, as I was describing earlier. So again, just we have good staff and we're, we're going to continue every effort to ensure that we stay open and provide services to the citizens. All right, appreciate it. Sean. Yeah, just a quick follow up, doctor. Um, now, am I right about uh, if you're positive and they send you home? I've got a boy that's in Tennessee calling me this morning, a little fever. Um, he don't have Wilma man killer down the road. Uh, is this, uh, is it still you can take Tylenol? Uh, not best to take uh, Motrin or ibuprofen. Drink plenty of fluids. And, you know, for those that are going home with a fever and the symptoms, what's, what's some of the, what are we telling those folks? Both ibuprofen and Tylenol are considered fever reducers, and so they're safe to use. Both ibuprofen? Fluids? Yes, they're both considered fever reducers and are safe to use, as long as you don't have a contraindication to either one of them. Okay. Certain people have to, you know, don't want to take Tylenol because they may have underlying liver disease. Huh, they're, huh. they're things you want to be careful about, but in general, those are safe to use to reduce the fever. Okay. Well, somebody told me um, ibuprofen wasn't good. Somebody's, but, well, good. So they can they can do like the old common, like we used to do the cold. You can uh, alternate those every four hours. And uh, so, all right. Any other tricks of the trade you, you tell them? Well, as you said, just drink plenty of fluids, get plenty of rest, and uh, and just uh, and just uh, and just uh, pray hard. That important thing is, if you yeah. test positive, you need to be sure and isolate and keep other and protect yourself from others. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for? Uh... Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Wes. Yeah, I, uh, two questions. <clears throat> One is now that we're in January, how many uh, doctors did we? did we lose last year? Do we have that number? I don't have that statistic on, on hand. Um, I, I would say that in the report, it does talk about the vacancy rate that we have. Um, it looks like Cherokee Nation Health Services has, Cherokee Nation Health Services has a 4.8 vacancy rate compared to the IHS standard of 25%. I do not, I do not have a, how many, uh, a, a number that we have lost, but overall our vacancy rate is very good. Could you give me the number of doctors that we lost last year? I will work with the team to, to see if we can pull that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that'd be great if you could get that to me. Um, and then the other one would be on our uh, transportation of pills, um, mainly uh, uh, the narcotics. Or do we have a tracking method or a tracking system that we're able to track it from? where we're ordering it from all the way to our pharmacy and then on to the client itself. I'm still not really sure of your question, but I, um, we do have um, standards in place that ensure that we are handling narcotics appropriately. We are audited from various um, groups from time to time. And to date, we have not had 
deficiencies with uh, narcotics. Okay, just seeing uh, kind of a, a, a drug increase on the streets. Uh, you notice the homelessness that kind of goes along with it, so it's apparent that it's in the area. I just didn't know if there was something in place that we could use uh, that would that would track where the pills are going from, and once they leave our pharmacy, if there if there's a pill bottle caught, you know, obviously there's you can scratch the name and stuff off of it, but if there are any sort of embedded tracking monitoring on that so that we know it was prescribed out of our pharmacy and who it was prescribed to so that way we can track it all back of where where a stop gap could be put in place uh, that's a great question um, we, we do prescribe the medication as the provider request as far as where it goes from there I, I don't know that there's a, tr a tracking tracking method on those place. bottles or something okay um, I, I've been I've kind of talked to a few people about that idea of having there was a tracking method on those bottles so that way whenever you know a local law enforcement picks someone up that they've been taking drugs that was sold on the street we can track that back if it came from one of our pharmacies what can we do is it is it over prescription in a certain area that's causing that outbreak to happen um, just something to look forward to try to help clean up the area so but appreciate you taking the time to answer the questions appreciate you um Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I had a question. So if someone has expired narcotics, are they able to maybe turn those in somewhere to Cherokee Nation Health Facilities for safe disposal? Dr. Montgomery, I'm not aware of our behavioral health efforts in regards to that or if there are any. Right, there is a, there is a specific way that you should dispose of them. and. And I would need to get back with you, uh, Counselor, about that information that we could really get back to you about that. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the time, Chair. Just to kind of a follow-up on your question, there's numerous police departments that have a dump box in their lobbies where you can go, and we have one at J. So, you know, there's a lot of them. If you just, you could probably get on the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics web page and they could probably tell you where those dump stations are if, if you needed to because for my understanding is expired narcotics or any kind of expired medicines you're not supposed to flush those down the uh you're not supposed to flush those or dispose of them in your uh your home garbage so you can Give those to the police station. Absolutely. It uh, okay. doesn't have to be expired. It can be for whatever reason. If you need to get it through any of them, you can, for whatever reason, you can dump them. Okay. There. Thank you very much. I had one more question on behavioral health services. Um, uh, you know, like I said, the increase in homelessness that we're seeing, a lot of it may be due to uh, behavioral health issues. Um, if someone who's diagnosed with, say, schizophrenia comes in, and um, obviously shows signs that it would be benefit to take him off the street and get him hospitalized. Um, are we doing that, or is there some sort of preventative thing that's keeping us from getting him issued into a hospital? Because I know of one circumstance where a homeless person was brought in uh, who's diagnosed and was, instead of being sent to a hospitalization facility, was given uh, medicine and a shot and told to go home. But if he's homeless, where is the home going to? And are we even going to guarantee him coming back into the system since he is homeless if he has to show back up for a doctor's appointment? Counselor, um, I, I can't speak to the one in particular case you're, you're talking about. I, I'm not familiar with that. But we do have resources available that do evaluate the patient's needs. Uh, behavioral health needs that they may have. Uh, depending on availability of beds uh, elsewhere uh, could be a determination. Um, there are multiple different factors and it's really a case by case basis on where the patient could potentially land. And um, as far as the homelessness and coming back to the uh, facility here, if there is a need that arises, we encourage someone to come and be evaluated within our emergency department or behavioral health department. Okay, appreciate it. I'll keep looking into this. I know uh, of this family that was dealing with it and try to help work them through the system because it seems like that might be something that comes up frequently is whenever you do get a homeless person in, they get a diagnosis, but then we're not able to find a facility to take them, and it just it uh, is a continuation of the problem of homelessness that we see in the area. So, But uh, I'll work on that, and I'll try to get some more information to, to you guys of how we could try to 
work on uh, on on methods and looking into ways that we might be able to develop to um, take those homeless people that that uh, suffer from those illnesses and try to get them into a situation uh, where they have a, a a roof over their head instead of trying to find somewhere to, to, to sleep at night whenever it's cold like this in the month and in the winter months it's really difficult to whenever I heard that that we were sending them back out without a home to go to and it's freezing temperatures at night um, I'm going okay if the beds are full everywhere you know what what do we need to do to prevent that from happening so but appreciate it thank you any other questions Wayne thanks for stepping in on short notice today dr. Montgomery thank you very much uh, Lisa and Dr. Gann, appreciate you as well. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. That's the finishing of our reports. I see no old business, no new business. How about announcements? The only one I know of the next, next announcement, Johnny. Thank you, Chair. I think um, <clears throat> I'd just like to uh, make a quick announcement. We've lost, uh, speaking of COVID, one of our Cherokee warriors out in San, uh, uh, Sacramento area um, who uh, we lost just before Christmas uh, succumbed to, uh, to COVID uh, while in the hospital, Mr. Mark DeMucha. And uh, he was a friend to many, and uh, he was one of the good ones out there. Uh, he spent more than 10 days in the hospital. Uh, one of our prominent Cherokee members out there in, the, in that uh, in that at-large area and just prayers to him and his family and his friends as they cope with uh, this ongoing uh, the death of uh, uh, one of their family members. Thank you, Counselor. Any other announcements? The, only, the next scheduled meeting is Valentine's Day at 1230. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn. And a second. Okay, this meeting is adjourned.